الزملاء الاعزاء والضيوف الكرام اسعدتم this guest this afternoon and welcome to this i know sessions held after lunch immediately are fraught with difficulties to say the least i hope that uh, you will find uh, in the following interventions what uh, re-energizes you and enjoyment to and interaction <coughs> now we have in this session we move to a country which uh, really suffered a lot because of conflict and fighting and uh, as we saw yesterday in the papers that we discussed that one of the most uh, difficult aspects to deal with is the damage uh, done to cultural heritage and societies and people today we will hear a number of researchers who have delved deeply into the uh, post-conflict heritage reconstruction in Libya. There are signs that there is some improvement, so we sincerely hope that a final settlement is reached so that the reconstruction construction and can begin and the heritage reconstruction also. The first speaker is Dr. Nurullah Abdul Zaid Valdil Mies. She is a professor at uh, Qatar University and uh, she will present on <coughs> the joint paper with her colleague Dr. Jamal Bissa'a. Uh, Ms. Noor works for Qatar Foundation since 2010. She is senior architect and she supervised the execution of many projects which fulfill the vision of Qatar Foundation on architecture. And she is also responsible for uh, protecting the cultural site within the borders of the education city. She has an MA from Ivarde in Venice in 2007. She has a BA in architecture from Benghazi in Libya in 2004. And it was a university where she worked as assistant professor before moving to Qatar. And she is an activist here who and participated in many meetings, conferences, and gathering. And uh, also she has many contributions here in Qatar. She's a member of the Qatar Society to the UNESCO's meeting, the 38th meeting of the UNESCO. She took part also in formulating the law on protecting culture of, and she has also been a member of the Society for traditional architecture in Qatar and the Gulf established with Qatar National Library and Liverpool University. And she also uh, focuses on the architecture in the Arab region uh, in post-conflict through some uh, uh, joint uh, projects with Qatar University and the Milano Polytechnic and we here in our center and the Doha Institute and the Arab Center 
we wish you success and uh, we hope that you will get your PhD next time you join us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for this introduction. So my, the paper that I presented for this um, for this conference is uh, titled uh, "Reflections and Continuity or Change for the Post-Conflict Recovery of the Historic City Center of Benghazi, Libya." Armed conflict transforms the national cohesion and historical narrative of societies. Cultural heritage destruction is a grave conflict and crisis affecting people's environments, identities, and sense of place. In its recovery in complex post-conflict environments, economic, social, and political difficulties as being a significant concern. Scholars in this and the case have classified post-conflict reconstruction methods for historic city centers, identifying two main trends based on two contrasting conceptual frameworks. The first is a strict adherence to classical heritage conservation concepts, refusing the historical classification or reconstruction. The second is a development-driven approach, calling for new beginnings, disregarding the cultural aspects of cities and responding to social, political, and economic drivers. A middle ground is considered a balanced approach to retain the pre-conflict urban fabric. Planners and decision makers regard wartime destruction as an opportunity for urban regeneration and post-war economic growth using Hussmanian models and neoliberal market ideals to forget the traumatic past and revive the post-conflict economy. On the other hand, supporters of urban heritage conservation promote the salvage of the remaining urban fabric and their city's cultural identity. They promote urban heritage as a critical resource for sustainable development. They promote urban heritage as a critical resource for sustainable development fostering economic growth and social cohesion. This paper analyzes the ambition to change towards a modern prosperous city versus the continuity of sustainable heritage-led urban regeneration as a post-conflict reconstruction paradigm for historic city centers. It will reflect on the lessons learned from such approaches for the post-conflict recovery of the historic center of the city of Benghazi. This paper will provide much needed guidance to Benghazi's relevant stakeholders and decision makers for the recovery planning vision and process. Additionally, historic city centers in similar circumstances can benefit from the restrictions raised in this paper. At an urban level, there is a difference between reconstruction and recovery, which adds a sociocultural layer to the physical reconstruction process. Both terms can be used towards establishing pre-conflict conditions or departing from them, implying that the cultural value of the post-conflict physical environment could or could not be prioritized during the decision-making. When prioritized, post-conflict cultural heritage aid projects usually revolve around rehabilitating and deconstructing heritage materiality guided by authenticity, heritage values, and safeguarding heritage for future regeneration. Most scholars agree that stylistic reconstruction of where it was and how it was mystify history, manipulating viewers and social memory. However, as a post-disaster approach, it is, supposed, it is supported by some scholars, such as Calame, Khalaf, and Piazzoni, to meet communities' need for continuity by providing a familiar place to grieve, claiming that a strong spatial visual identity boosts spiritual well-being and collective memory. This approach has been carried out extensively from reconstruction monuments like Mozart Bridge to rebuilding complete city center like the case of Warsaw. These claims are, su are supported by mm, people-place relation theories, where humanistic geographers believe that place attachment as an emotional connection to a meaningful place can increase a person's sense of belonging and meaning. Concerned researches highlight that conflict-related place disruptions include place loss, displacement, and relocation destroy people's socio-physical relationship, causing trauma, grief, longing, habit memory disruption, estrangement, and alienation. The recent shift from classical conservation centered in the, in, in the Venice Charter to management of change and sustainable development prioritizes people's needs. 
the hi historic urban landscape concepts as mentioned in the Warsaw Recommendation inform this more inclusive heritage management strategy. To achieve a people-centered heritage-led and place-specific recovery following a conflict, pre-existing social, spatial, and economic networks must be considered. However, with the weakness of emergent post-conflict governments, the reconstruction demand from the space groups and their desire to erase the trauma of war, modern city images to revamp city center and fuel the economic recovery appeal to decision makers. Such development considerably modifies cities' physical and social cultural fabric. Proposals to follow by Route Solidaire or the Dubai model have been put forward in places such as Mosul, Aleppo, and Benghazi. In Dubai, the traditional skyline and image were transformed by high-profile urbanism and gleaming architecture of large-scale private projects. Similar to other cities in the region, Dubai's pace of development didn't allow for the production of context-appropriate planning paradigms, leading to the adoption of readily available Western models and the loss of the Arabic urban fabric. According to Fabri and to Mazzetto, the rapid architectural transformation of the traditional environment blurred the perception of place identity, eroded the sense of belonging, and in the end, distorted the idea of common heritage. Recently, as highlighted by Zaidan 2019, Dubai has followed the regional trend of sustainable urban development, including policies related to the promotion of culture, tradition, and identity to restore the loss acknowledging by that the cultural heritage importance in fostering localized sustainability and resilience for a smarter, inclusive, and sustainable city futures. Let's go to Benghazi now. Benghazi is Libya's second largest city, located in the eastern part of the country. It's a port city constructed by Cyrenaica's Greeks as a peninsula between the seas and the salt marshes, or the Sabhas before going under the Roman and Byzantine empires preceded by the Arab conquest. The, the city remained modest through the Ottoman period until the Italian occupation of Libya. Libyan independence was declared from Benghazi in 1951, when the city was acknowledged as Tripoli's twin capital and the kingdom's government seat. Gaddafi's military rule sparked in 1996 and lasted for 42 years, characterized by limited urban development, heritage neglect, and demolition. In 2003, the Libya of Tomorrow movement led by Gaddafi's son opened the doors for drafting major infrastructure projects, which, which came to a halt in 2011 when the Libyan addition to the Arab Spring initiated in Benghazi against Gaddafi and his regime. Benghazi historic city center is divided in two parts, the Italian and the Arab Ottoman sections. This is the... Arab Ottoman section, the green and the blue, and this is the Italian section. The Arab Ottoman section is wrapping around the ancient uh, ruins of the Greek uh, city, and then uh, the uh, Italian uh, fabric has uh, respected what was there before, and the additions are at the borders of the old city, only with some addition, um, like uh, in introd introduced, like the connection between the two uh, portions, sorry. Uh, and at this point here, ending by the municipality, Square, which is this one here, the municipality square and the old traditional souks with the two minarets are um, the major ca characteristics of the Ottoman area. And then we have the uh, the lighthouse or the manara and the cathedral, two domed cathedral, which are the like the biggest landmarks of the Italian uh, era. However. Although the fabric is still readable during subsequent periods, the old city has been subject to abandonment, neglect, intentional demolition, and mismanagement. In 2011, the Libyan addition to the Arab Spring initiated in Benghazi against Gaddafi and his regime. At the time, the old city was relatively unaffected by the clashes, but militias plays, played a significant role in subsequent years, resulting in violent conflicts between rival fac factors beginning in 2012 and leading to a second civil war. In 2014, the Battle of Benghazi, also called the Karama, or War of Dignity, started when Islamist militias affiliated to ISIS took control of the city. It was an armed conflict led by the Libyan National Army against the terrorist groups who used the city as a shield. During this period, citywide confrontations forced local communities' evacuation and led to infrastructure damage. The city was liberated from extremist militias by 2017 ending 
uh, at the old city with fierce combat, including heavy shelling and aerial bombardment, dilapidating the area's historic fabric. Several damage assessments have been conducted since 2015. This is the last one available in 2018, which was based on aerial views and collecting all the previous um, damage assessments, trying to evaluate them and produce one unique uh, resource. Uh, it was also confronted on the ground, but on only from the outside of the buildings. No proper like damage of the inside of the buildings was conducted. But uh, as you can see here, all the um, orange are substantial damage uh, buildings, and all the red are totally damaged buildings, with the yellow being light to moderate damage. Um, seen from the map, almost all the uh, old city has some kind of damage. With the continuous political instability, no reconstruction effort has happened in the old city yet, and most of the streets continue to be deserted. In 2016, the Libyan interim government established a committee for the stability and reconstruction of Benghazi, in addition to the Benghazi Reconstruction Fund. In 2018, a Greek company procured via unclear processes submitted a proposal for the city redevelopment, working with the Benghazi municipality. In 2021, the Libyan government of National Union released a resolution to fund the rebuilding of Benghazi and Darna. And since November 2020, an emergency team have been working on fast track projects to upgrade, to upgrade Benghazi's damaged infrastructure. However, all these efforts have not seen any impact on the old city and its displaced community, apart from some damage destructions demolition, including historic buildings and landmarks. The efforts so far have been mainly conducted by the local community and NGOs, from remo rubble removal and the cleaning of the streets to personal efforts in rebuilding houses, public spaces, and souks, which continue to be deserted for the lack of livelihood opportunities. Local authorities have been working independently and with the help of UNDP to reconstruct and restore some emblematic heritage sites. However, there are some concerns that, these, that the interventions are poorly executed with poor local available expertise and resources. The old city of Benghazi is the community's beating heart. It suffered for decades before and during the conflict, le leaving a deep wound in the community, reflected in the effort put by locals to keep it alive with the volunteering work for its recovery, their gathering of uh, scrambling streets for celebration, the number of social media groups that have created, have created uh, mm, to perpetuate its memory. On the other hand, as per a study made by the Faituri in 2021, the site of disaster and devastation and the desire to forget war scenes encourage some community members to wish for the drastic shift to a contemporary metropolis. Similarly, legislators and decision makers regard the area as an appealing enclave for investment. Elite organizations promote culture as a driver for peace building, social cohesion, and inclusive sustainable development. On the other hand, supporters of neoliberal development claim that they can help the economy by luring private capital and promoting economic expansion. Lessons learned have shown that the departure from the pre-existing traditional urban form to modern glamorous ones does not necessarily bring prosperous post-conflict recovery to urban and social economic levels. As witnessed in the reconstruction of downtown Beirut in the civil war, having an inclusive comprehensive vision for the desired outcome uh, and the tools to implement it vigorously influenced the reconstruction result. In Beirut, a vision was there, but the envisioned neoliberal development was detached from the community expectations and needs. Opposite to Warsaw, where the reconstruction vision targeted the post-war community's well-being. Although both visions included a level of change to the pre-conflict urban environment, the reconstruction goals and implementation process led to, en to entirely different outcomes. On the other hand, reconstructions that happened without a vision lead to haphazard results and a fragmented urban environment. In Sarajevo, even though efforts were put forward during and after the conflict to preserve the city's heritage and identity, the lack of, of enforcement mechanism meant the loss of historical layers to new developments over time. In a city like Benghazi, where urban areas have expanded immensely beyond the historic city center, characterized by bland architecture and urbanism, modern projects following sustainable urban development Modern projects following sustainable urban development guidelines constitute an opportunity to upgrade such areas, increasing the life quality of their inhabitants.
However, the historic city center of Benghazi, as the carrier of its people's shared memory and identity, must learn from past experiences and as an opportunity to build back better, to preserve its memory as a catalyst for its future, it should embark in a culturally-led urban regeneration of, it, of its degraded pre-conflict-built heritage to enable it as a source of sustainable gro growth, healing, and well-being for its community, taking into account um, all the stakeholders' involvement in the reconstruction vision planning and implementation, including local communities, government officials, and international organizations. A comprehensive approach to reconstruction that balances long-term and short-term solutions, balancing pre-conflict continuity and the needed upgrade change for sustainable growth solutions. Show clear governance, transparency, and accountability in managing reconstruction funds to ensure effective and efficient use. Effective coordination and cooperation between different organizations and agencies, including international ones. Use the reconstruction process as a platform for capacity building and job creation at different levels. Balance expenditure on monuments and public areas with the community pressing needs, such as housing reconstruction and compensation to avoid resentment. And use guided private-public partnerships that support reconstruction needs and foster economic development. In conclusion, Post-conflict recovery is not one size fits all. It must be adjusted based on local circumstances, making consensus building a difficult task for decision makers. The potential effect on communities must be considered when planning physical changes to urban areas, especially during reconstruction after traumatic events. The continuity of pre-war historic environments has been promoted to build back better, despite competing with heritage conservation ideologies for the benefit that heritage has on post-trauma community well-being and as a spur to sustainable urban growth. The decision makers of Benghazi and elsewhere should benefit from the lessons learned from post-conflict recovery experiences and the global cities they inspire to model. The balance between continuity and change should be based on carefully considering the community's needs and the area's pre-conflict conditions. It's also crucial to involve the local community in the decision-making and physical recovery process, ensuring that their rights are respected. The reconstruction process to be successful needs to be inclusive, transparent, sustainable, fair, and equitable. As an end note, the recovery of historic cities must be aimed at recovering their community's physical and socioeconomic qualities in the first place to enable the return of the displaced, provided with adequate livelihood, livelihood opportunities to grow, heal and prosper, rooted in their past and looking with ambition towards their future. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, fast-paced presentation uh, of uh, the reconstruction challenges in uh, Libya and Benghazi in particular. And I take note uh, of the distinction that you grew uh, or, or you drew between uh, reconstruction and uh, recovery. I worked in uh, conflict areas for many, many years uh, in my previous life as a UN official. And uh, I could see that one of the major challenges is not reconstruction in its uh, as, as a physical uh, enterprise in a way, but in recovery, which subsumes, uh, I would say, the meanings of uh, uh, salvation in a way. It has, it has a human uh, dimension to it, as well as a cultural dimension. If you go to a post-conflict country, usually, uh, I would say it's very easy to rebuild a bridge, to rebuild the, the structures in a city, but to rebuild the scarred uh, dignity, the scarred souls of the population is, uh, is the real challenge. Uh, I also grew up as a child in Beirut, and I know the old Beirut. When I go now, I don't know Beirut. Uh, in the reconstruction process, there has been no effort to preserve the historical heritage of the city, and I think that the whole uh, project uh, was, in a way, inspired by uh, savage capitalism, in a way. Uh, but thank you very much. I'm sure 
we will have uh, a lot of questions. لدينا في المداخلة التالية And the third, two gentlemen, Mahmoud Hadiya and Ahmed Massoud, and they'll be talking to us about Libya and Sibrata, the Sibrata Heritage Protection Project, developing a new methodology to assess the impact of the crossfire on the Roman theatre. Uh, my yeah, my surname is Hadia. Well, it's Hadia. He worked uh, in the education sector for a number of years, uh, following uh, uh, his graduation from Tripoli University, and uh, he uh, worked with the Department of Antiquities of Libya, and uh, he was uh, very diligent, uh, and um, he uh, had some training courses uh, about. Uh, uh, the antiquities related elements and he had a project uh, that was uh, pertinent to the Red Castle supported by the fund of uh, American ambassadors uh, in cooperation with uh, the Department of Antiquities of Libya and Oberlin uh, College. He works uh, since 2006 16 in his post uh, and uh, especially when it comes to the protection of uh, uh, antiquities. Uh, Ahmed Masoud also from the Department of Antiquities uh, of Libya. He uh, uh, studied uh, uh, archaeology in the Al Khums University and he has uh, received uh, a master's degree. He's an activist in uh, the domain of uh, uh, registration of uh, archaeological sites uh, and uh, uh, different uh, uh, other uh, issues. Uh, and uh, he worked uh, with the department since its inception. Mr. Ahmed Masoud also participated in uh, implementing a number of uh, uh, projects uh, in the domain of uncovering the historical sites uh, and their assessments thereby. 15 minutes for both. Please abide by the time. We'll be grateful if you abided by the time. Please be upon you the summary of uh, uh, this paper is uh, the Sabrata Heritage Protection developing a new methodology to assess the impact of crossfire on the Roman theater. This is one of uh, the aspects of uh, the recovery efforts uh, carried out by the Department of Antiquities of Libya. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, those in charge of this conference for their support, for their invitation. Today, we'll be talking about uh, a project uh, between Durham University. Anna Luni was uh, the head of the project in cooperation with Lisa Moll, a professor uh, from uh, uh, West Anglia. University. I would like to emphasize uh, the fact that this took place during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and uh, uh, following this cooperation we were able to uh, carry out uh, this project uh, and the analysis thereby. I would like also to extend our gratitude to the experts Patricia, uh, Eska Gilbert uh, for their support uh, uh, from their respective countries. So Brata is one of the uh, uh, important sites in Tripolitania, 
in the west uh, of Libya, and uh, the settlements go back to the Bonitian era, which uh, alludes to the fact that it has been a commercial hub that has uh, developed uh, during the Roman and Byzantine empires. Uh, humans have lived there uh, up until uh, uh, the 10th uh, century. During the 20th century, a number of archaeological uh, 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 projects have been launched uh, and uh, Sobrata has been listed on the World Heritage of the UNESCO in uh, 1982 and it has been, uh, this uh, site has been included indeed as a World Heritage Site. In October 2016, uh, this uh, site uh, uh, has uh, been put on the list of endangered uh, uh, sites uh, because of the conflict uh, uh, in Libya. Now I'll be talking about the Roman theater uh, following this video. Perhaps I'll mute it and I'll comment on the content of the video. This uh, theater, this theater is uh, one of the most important uh, archaeological uh, splendid sites uh, in the uh, south uh, uh, and the southern eastern part of the city. It has been built uh, uh, between the, uh, s the end of the second uh, and the beginning of the third uh, uh, century BC. In October uh, 2016, uh, uh, conflict uh, uh, flared up and uh, this has been affected uh, greatly because um, it has been used as barracks uh, 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 by one of the militias uh, and uh, uh, because of the crossfire, uh, uh, it uh, has uh, been affected uh, negatively. So Brata is a coastal uh, city and uh, hence uh, it has been used uh, as uh, a point uh, uh, for uh, illegal immigration crossing. Before embarking on the uh, project on the ground, as you know, we had conducted consultations with the team members uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, received some training on the equipment that has been used uh, to assess uh, the status of the uh, archaeological site. Uh, this uh, in-depth uh, study has been conducted not to understand uh, the superficial kind of uh, damage uh, uh, that have been inflicted on the uh, site, but uh, because of different kind of fears, uh, especially uh, the status of the stones themselves. Uh, and uh, it has been incumbent on us uh, uh, before maintaining the site uh, to conduct this uh, in-depth uh, uh, study to understand how it can be uh, maintained. Uh, this uh, 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 damage uh, has uh, endangered uh, the stability of the uh, uh, building itself, the theater, and we wanted to stave off its uh, 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 collapse. Uh, we, uh, 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 with this study, assessed uh, the damages uh, uh, because of the crossfire that took place in 2016. Following the documentation of these uh, damages, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, necessary to uh, understand uh, uh, this issue and the implications thereby on the long run. Uh, this, uh, uh, in the uh, future, will uh, uh, provide us uh, with a chance uh, 
and to understand uh, the structural stability of this site uh, because uh, the uh, last maintenance that took place uh, took place indeed long time ago and in light with the complications uh, of the building itself uh, accessing or understanding the detail of the impact of uh, the crossfire was uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, impossible to use uh, the uh, normal kind of uh, uh, um, cameras but we uh, uh, use the drones uh, in order to take photos and to document uh, the damages uh, because uh, uh, drones were uh, more effective uh, in uh, uh, taking uh, uh, accurate uh, photos uh, uh, of the theater and in detail. It was necessary to have uh, 900 uh, or hundreds of uh, photos. Indeed, we have reached 900 photos uh, to have this model in place uh, so that we can depend on it uh, to uh, uh, make any intervention in the future. We have uh, used uh, uh, high-definition cameras uh, uh, with the drones, obviously, and uh, we have uh, uh, used uh, also uh, some of the softwares uh, that uh, uh, are popular in, in these kind of scenarios. Uh, an assistance kind of uh, computer assistance technologies, uh, X for the capture that uh, 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 provides. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, kind of borders of uh, uh, the sortie, if I might say, and the uh, photos uh, thereby. And as we know, this uh, kind of uh, uh, drones uh, has uh, GPS uh, uh, embedded in it, and uh, because of the of some of the inaccuracies uh, of the GPS in the drones. Uh, uh, it was necessary to uh, have the granular control points, uh, the GCP, in order to have uh, more accurate uh, measurements uh, and more accurate information. As uh, we uh, embarked on the first uh, pilot of uh, using the foot scan and uh, uh, other technologies, uh, we encountered some problems in the model, and uh, thus we retook the photos uh, using the drones again, uh, uh, so, so that uh, uh, the photos can be more accurate, uh, because we had some loopholes in the first uh, uh, attempt. The uh, second uh, step uh, was to do with uh, studying and assessing the damages uh, uh, following the crossfire. And uh, this uh, uh, study uh, w has uh, uh, pinpointed kind of uh, more than 160 uh, uh, areas that have been affected by the crossfire. Uh, this has been uh, 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 ominous. And thus, uh, we wanted uh, to uh, uh, train. We have to to, to, to kind of test uh, some of the other points in order to have uh, uh, data uh, whereby we can uh, uh, understand the partial uh, damage, uh, uh, so that uh, the uh, picture uh, can be holistic uh, uh, in this regard. Victorizing the point uh, uh, took place uh, following 160 uh, uh, kind of uh, locations of damages in the western and eastern uh, uh, walls, uh, the facade of the theater, and in addition uh, uh, to uh, the theater itself. Thank you. Mr. Ahmed will continue. Thank you. Uh, what took place here is uh, uh, 
the fight uh, and the shelling uh, rather than saber kind of wrestling and that's why there was uh, a huge damage uh, uh, we uh, kind of uh, I wanted to ident identify the damage uh, in the areas uh, and we wanted to document that uh, uh, accurately uh, so that uh, this can be tested uh, in order to understand the, uh, the the measurement or the level or the degree of uh, solidity of the stones uh, themselves. The sample related network uh, has been uh, drawn uh, by uh, pencils or uh, any other method uh, so that uh, this cannot deface the uh, stones themselves uh, and uh, we took the measurement uh, of uh, the solidity using uh, the bambino what is called bambino uh, a measurement uh, equipment in addition to that uh, the measurements on the field after the online training uh, uh, we understood that we wanted we wanted to uh, understand the measurements combined with uh, ballistic analysis uh, so uh, as you know the uh, light kind of weapons uh, uh, does uh, 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 inflict huge damage on the stones uh, and uh, the projectiles have uh, uh, weakened uh, the surface of the stones uh, and thus uh, uh, it, it ha all these stones have been uh, affected greatly by humidity and uh, other kind of uh, weather conditions uh, uh, this has made the stones more porous uh, and uh, have led uh, to the dissolution of the stones themselves uh, so we had certain damages before the crossfire but still uh, the crossfire played uh, uh, a role in inflicting uh, damage uh, on the stones uh, themselves uh, and uh, the Sobrata, as you know, is a coastal uh, site, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, site is prone uh, to uh, the effects uh, of uh, the salt itself uh, that uh, might emanate from the waves of the uh, sea itself. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, the underground water uh, has uh, its own uh, uh, impact uh, as well. We've discovered that uh, the damaged uh, uh, parts uh, uh, in the theater following the projectiles were uh, uh, rebuilt uh, using the original uh, stones uh, and uh, uh, in some other areas uh, cement and iron uh, have been used uh, because these two uh, elements have been available between 1934 and 1936, Sir Jacob Mogwedi uh, planned uh, to have this theater in place. Uh, between 1936 and 1937, Jacobo Caputo continued the mission. Uh, so, Mr. Jacobo planned, and we have destroyed this theater, and uh, we needed to maintain it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, and uh, documentation took place uh, it's worthy noting that uh, the uh, reconstruction efforts uh, took place uh, uh, using uh, cement uh, on a continuous basis because it was available and it has been used to plug all the gaps uh, in the structure itself, uh, especially the crowns. Uh, and it has been used in the facade of the theater. And uh, uh, albeit uh, uh, it was judicious not to use cement, however, it has been used because it was uh, available, as I said, uh, so that the theater can be uh, protected uh, further against any projectiles or crossfire. The facade of the theater was fragile indeed and thus uh, we had uh, 
used uh, the cement for the first and second floors to support the foundations because this is a very important uh, part uh, for the safety of the whole structure and uh, as far as the intact control uh, stone hardness uh, versus the impacted stone hardness uh, those uh, parts that have been inflicted by the projectile their surfaces uh, were weaker than the other stones uh, obviously and uh, uh, we wanted to study uh, this uh, kind of part uh, we have utilized the test uh, of hardness against uh, the uh, sound kind of stones uh, so that we can compare the two together and uh, the percentage thereby has been calculated and through this uh, 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 study we have uh, uh, monitored uh, the changes in humidity and temperature the eastern and western part of the theater have been uh, more prone to weakness uh, because of the projectiles as well as the humidity and the increasing temperature in all seasons uh, as well as the salt in comparison to the facade of the theater in the south uh, this means uh, that uh, the decline of the uh, structure of the uh, stone has uh, affected uh, the whole structure Using the 3D technology, we have uh, 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 reached uh, uh, an analysis uh, and a conception uh, that uh, provided us with information to understand the crossfire impact. And here you can see the uh, 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 blue uh, arrows and the red arrows of the crossfire. As I said, uh, the western and eastern walls uh, were more uh, affected than others, as I said, because of the uh, uh, difference in humidity, temperature. And uh, this is the first uh, project that has uh, uh, taken place, uh, uh, whereby a, a full report with recommendations uh, uh, has been uh, uh, drafted indeed uh, it has been uh, uh, reported to the unesco and e-commerce and the identification of weakness areas to monitor as well as a solid base for future uh, conservation uh, project uh, in fact uh, we cannot understand uh, the impact 100 uh, percent uh, unless we understand uh, uh, the impact of the projects and uh, the uh, structure itself. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud uh, and uh, Masoud, for this uh, invaluable intervention. It has uh, moved us uh, to the hands-on kind of uh, domain uh, things that go on the ground uh, practical kind of uh, uh, scenarios we wanted obviously to exchange insights uh, and uh, to understand the theories and the practices and it is uh, a, a chance uh, to exchange uh, expertise and understand the challenges and the uh, chances uh, we'll deal with uh, sabrata but uh, from a different angle uh, this is the angle of uh, cultural values, uh, whether we have universal common values or not, we will hear about that. So the title will be 
whose common values and culture, examining the EU policy on reconstruction. And this presentation will be delivered by uh, Aurora uh, Lucretia Ham. I hope I pronounce it right. Okay. Uh, so Aurora is a research master's student in heritage, memory, and archaeology at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, her main research interest is the use of heritage in peace and community building and the past and present role of the, e of the EU's cultural policy in this process. Aurora combines a keen insight into heritage, art history, history in general, and politics to assess if and how uh, material heritage reconstruction can be instrumentalized for good, for the good of humanity. At the Doha conference, at this conference, she will contribute to critical heritage studies by assessing the inclusion of cultural heritage in EU policy documents and its implementation through projects on the ground. Following the conclusion of her research uh, master's, research uh, master's degree, Aurora intends to pursue a PhD to deepen her knowledge of these topics and to contribute to the academic and political debate. Her previous academic background consists of a BA in history and political science at the University of Bonn and a BA in art history at the University of Vienna. Aurora is a German national, uh, very uh, interesting and diverse background and we wish you best of luck in your presentation and more luck in your PhD. Um, it's International Women's Day, um, so maybe we can all take a short moment to think about the women in our lives and globally who are fighting against violence and oppression while I put on my PowerPoint. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you foremost uh, to the organizers. Thank you, Noor. Thank you, thank you Zinat, um, for inviting me. I'm talking um, about whose culture, whose common values and culture, examining EU policy on post-conflict rehabilitation of cultural heritage by using the example of the brother. Uh, before lunch, we already heard from Dr. Kani about reconstruction of cultural diplomacy of Iran, and I basically explore this um, for European Union policy. Um, I am also using the example of Sir so there will be a little bit of overlap. Um, I'll first give you a short overview about the history of Sir and I'll keep this very short, but I will include um, issues such as uh, Romanita, colonialism and fascism in Libya. Then I will go on to uh, the renovation of this reconstruction from 2022, which was financed by the European Union. Um, then I'll ask myself how and why does the EU finance a restoration in Libya and go into the policy on heritage in conflict in the EU more broadly. And after that, I will tie it back to the EU UNDP renovation in Sabrathar to make more general points about the divergence of theory and practice. Um, Sabrathar is my case study because it em it's very emblematic of a lot of things that are going wrong with EU policy. Um, we already heard about things that are going right, but uh, that's not what I'm here for. Uh, so Sabrathar Theatre was reopened in February 2022 after renovations had been carried out by the UNDP, which were financed by the European Union. And uh, this, I'm not sure what happened to the quality of the image, but this is uh, from the UNDP website. Um, at this opening, a UNDP representative said, the Roman theater is a symbol of how common values and culture may, uni may unify communities and contribute to peace and reconciliation in Libya. Now let's investigate this assessment. Uh, the theater as a symbol, a symbol of what exactly? 
uh, common values and culture may unify communities. Whose common values and culture are we actually talking about and which communities exactly? Contribute to peace and reconciliation in Libya. According to Leuventhal and UNSC resolution 2347, as well as several speakers at this uh, conference, heritage is in its essence conflictual. So how does it have the potential to contribute to peace and reconciliation in Libya? None of these questions are answered uh, in the official information provided by UNDP and the EU. So I went to investigate and I'll share my findings with you. Uh, so very shortly, Sabrathar is a Roman theater. Um, it is also a, a modern town, but I'm obviously only talking about the archeological site and specifically the Roman theater. Uh, it's originally a Phoenician site, became part of the Roman Empire in 46 BC, and the theater was erected in the second century AD. Um, there are several connotations of empire already in Sabrathar itself. The pulpitum, which is the part under, uh, right under the stage, basically, uh, displays a loyalty scene where the personifications of Sabrathar shakes the hand and visually declares loyalty to Rome. Keti Nyanantunu laid out in her 2022 PhD thesis on staging Roman emperors that there is scant archeological evidence for this interpretation and explains its relevance in literature with the first people who came up with this interpretation, which were colonial Italian archeologists. Sabratha was reconstructed between 1935 and 1937 by colonial Roman archeologists who followed the ideology of Romanità. The idea that the modern nation state of Italy was the successor of the Roman Empire and its civilizing mission in North Africa. The practice of using Rome as an ideological predecessor um, is obviously very old, as old as uh, the Holy Roman Empire, but in colonialism in North Africa, it was first used by the French. The Italians adopted this during the Italo-Turkish War and thus justified their claim on the Libya as a historic claim. Romanità became part of the fascist ideology in the process. The quality of the archaeological work suffered from this ideological embedding as stratigraphic work was abandoned in favor of a clearance, basically. This meant that all layers above the classical Roman period, meaning material traces of Byzantine, early Arab, later Arab, late Roman period, were all neglected, and thus we have basically no information on them. Romanità was also combined with a touristic agenda. They wanted to have sites with a high visual impact for tours, for propagandistic, but also for economic um, reasons. Part of this visual imp impact approach was the reconstruction of the Roman theater in Sabrathar. This was done using anastylosis, uh, meaning that the original blocks were used as much as possible and interventions were made mostly visible. Uh, this was very much on vogue in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and is a way to construct heritage and a way to construct a past that we need to be aware of when we're thinking about Sabrathar. So the three-story theater that you saw um, also earlier in the uh, presentation before me was reconstructed but left intentionally open to create a ruin. Uh, this is something that Chiara talked about yesterday as well and that we also need to be aware of when we're thinking about the theater in Sabrathar. In 1937, when the reconstruction theater was re-inaugurated, Reinaugurated, Mussolini was present for rendition of Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. Under these conditions, it's not surprising that the loyalty scene was interpreted as such. Sabrathar swearing fealty to Rome. Keti Nyanantono um, summarizes this best by saying, to the eyes of many, Sabrathar's theater offered an ideal palimpsest for the presentation of Italian colonial rule as anchored in a tangible, literally reconstructed past. So the pulpitum and the theater by extension are a symbol of how archeology span is used for political will and thus becomes a symbol of fascist ideology. I'm not saying it's only a symbol of that, but that is definitely part of its symbolism. Um, the modern history of Sabrathar, uh, 1982, as we already heard, UNESCO World Heritage, 2011, there was already some minor damage but the Blue Shield report from 2011 was not too concerned and um, especially emphasized that in other parts of Libya, uh, brave Libyans protected their cultural heritage. In 2016, there was major damage on the theater 
as um, and then it was inscribed on the World Heritage List in danger. The theater was used as a shield, so it was not specifically targeted. I think that's also important to emphasize. And then in 2022, there was um, the report that we heard before in the presentation before me. Um, but at the same time, and that's where it got confusing for me, there was also a renovation of the EU in Febrather. Uh, the DOA report that we heard was meant as a priori to any renovations. So how was there at the same time a reopening in early 2022? It was very confusing. Um, this re renovation uh, was financed through managing mixed migration flows in Libya, through expanding protection spaces and supporting local socioeconomic development. So for economic opportunities. The 26 action fiche um, that is this program has no mention of heritage and it mentions culture only in connection to culturally appropriate food items for refugees and migrants. Um, it did have a very huge budget, but it did not incorporate heritage at all. Um, this primarily economic aim in Sabratha is echoed by a EU, EU representative in the um, press release of the reopening in 2022, where he says, Libya's shared cultural heritage has all the potential to become an important driver for sustainable development. Extraordinary archaeological sites, like the Roman Theater in Sembrather, offer immense opportunities for the communities to create jobs and boost the local economy. Uh, this is combined with an aim of 500,000 visitors to Sembrather annually, um, which obviously has not happened yet. Um, and this really underlines that the restoration was treated like an afterthought of the mixed migration flow project with the primary aim of producing an, econ an economic opportunity. Um, so what actually is the EU policy on heritage in conflict? The EU has included cultural heritage in its foreign policy since 1992, since the Maastricht Treaty. Generally, it has a very positivist framing of heritage um, as a cure of conflict that will ensure sustainable development and pos positive peace for communities in its uh, policy documents. This is an opposition to documents uh, such as UNSC 2347 and most heritage theory. Also at this conference, we've talked about the conflictual nature of reconstruction and heritage more broadly, uh, which is not reflected in EU policy documents. Barely reflected in policy, or not at all. Uh, I will outline three EU institutions which play the biggest role in this, and their different documents. Um, differ their different documents obviously also um, show their different mandates and missions of the institutions, and I'll only briefly outline all three documents, as I'm aware that not everyone is excited about policy documents. Uh, but I'm doing this to make a broader point. So first, we have the Council of the EU. Uh, Council of the EU is the EU body convening all relevant ministers of member states, so all foreign ministers of the different 20 si yeah, 27 uh, member states. Uh, this document is from April 2021, and it says basically that heritage is a vehicle for peace, but this document also says that it can be a trigger and target for conflicts. Um, heritage protection should be baked into EU foreign policy documents, and the council document is basically just broad outlines and a general positioning as um, council documents tend to be. They're not very specific, they're not very detailed, they don't have any clear policy objectives, they're just general ideas, I'd say. Um, the, third, uh, the second document is the EAS document from June 2021. Um, the EAS is essentially the foreign service of the EU and represents the Commission. It's, it's a bit more complicated, but we'll leave it at that. Um, the EAS has asks for best practices, specifically the Warsaw Recommendation of 2018 and the PATH document developed by ICCRM in 2021 to be taken into account when considering the reconstruction, restoration, and the re revitalization of cultural heritage. Restoration decisions should be carefully considered and uh, consider the need of local communities and take into account job creation and the financial gains of tourism. And then third, we have the longest document and the most recent, which is a EU Parliament uh, resolution from December 20, 
2022. And the e European Parliament um, consists of uh, parliamentarians from all different uh, 27 member states in country overarching fractions. This represents a wide variety of voices, which is quite typical for a parliament resolution, but it crucially does not include a critical reflection on the dangers and misuse of heritage. They decry the deliberate destruction of cultural si sites in Ukraine by Russia. Um, and this really represents a missed opportunity to reflect on the reasons for Russia to destroy Ukrainian heritage, which is both a target in the illegal war of aggression and a means of justification. So this is the latest um, EU, pol EU policy positioning on heritage and conflict. Um, now let's back at uh, policy and compare the practice in Sabranza. Um, so more details into what exactly was restored and which on which scientific basis this was done is not publicly available. Uh, this shows a lack of transparency in EU financing which is worrying in itself, uh, but also uh, scientific considerations that there is a lack of scientific considerations when working with a 2,000 year old, almost 2,000 year old um, object. And anyone who has ever tried to get EU financing will know that this is very hard and that transparency is one of the most important aspects of this, um, which was not reflected in what happened here at all. Um, sorry. So the EU um, did not follow best practice examples in Sabrathar. They are not using the PATH document or the Boasa recommendations. So the best practice examples that they themselves know about and that they set out in other policy documents. Um, there is no information whether uh, they did any sort of community assessment before and because there is no information I have to assume that there wasn't anything done um, and I think it's safe to consider that there wasn't. Abandoning scientific principles in order to create an economic opportunity in Sabrathar was already done by colonial archaeologists and the EU should be very wary into whose footsteps they are stepping with their policy in Libya. Uh, economic aims without considering the complexity of the situation also ignores the ongoing armed conflict in Libya and the lack of inclusion of communities threatens to make the theater a target in the future, possible target. Cultural heritage is alone is not a cure for conflict. It must, be treated like an af it must not be treated like an afterthought and it needs to be embedded into a wider reconciliation effort. So let us go back to the UNDP statement. Uh, the theater as a symbol, a symbol of what? Due to the colonial history of archaeological heritage in Libya, which is quite clear in Sabrathar, uh, the theater is also a symbol of how colonial oppression and history making by, Italian fascist regime, by the Italian fascist regime, a symbol of the hierarchy of value that prioritizes ancient Rome and disregards Byzantine or early Arab material traces. Common values and culture to unify communities whose common values and culture and which communities. The program, so the mixed migration program, under which this was financed is explicitly aimed at local communities. But suddenly this is meant to encompass all of Libyan society. Uh, how is the theater a symbol of values? And lastly, contribute to peace and reconciliation in Libya. This promise of heritage can only be kept if it encompasses elements of reconciliation and local engagement, none of which was incorporated into this restoration. Uh, so, in conclusion, EU policymaking has been called naive in its regard of cultural heritage as an unproblematic social good. And when looking at Sabrathar, I'm inclined to agree with the statement. The EU practice risk creating future targets and triggers for conflicts. Um, there is a strong need for future research into EU policy developments, and the impact and implementation on the ground is needed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Aurora, for this uh, fascinating presentation. I always found critical uh, approaches to be uh, very in interesting. 
and you coming from Germany, you must be schooled in the Frankfurt School approaches. <laughs> uh, uh, this is an approach that always digs into the ideological foundations of things as well as the motivations of individuals and collectivities, whether we're talking about states or uh, 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 unions of states. So we open the floor to questions, and I can see many hands uh, here. So we start with the gentleman over there, since uh, you were the first one to raise your hand. Thank you very much. Wonderful panel. Actually, I have a, a comment to the, la to the last pr uh, presentation, also about the, the broader um, difference between also discourse and practice in the in the in the um, in, in the EU um, in the UK. So actually, um, while also yesterday I talked about how the E the EU would talk about this idea of uh, of um, let's say using this cosmopolitan heritage p p paradigm. In practice, actually, it's uh, it not only in conflict situations, but in regular, uh, let's say, urban development and regeneration um, practice, it's it's quite different. So actually, before doing my PhD, I worked for a few years um, with local authorities on, on heritage projects. And if we needed to access EU funds, it was never possible to talk about heritage. We needed to talk about the economic value, the jobs created. So it was it was always heritage was seen as a tool. Um, to an economic good, and that's part of how the, e the, the, um, the EU structural funds for cohesion, which are accessible mostly by southern and eastern states, are, uh, are done. So basically, the, 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 the heritage is not the common good, that's the goal. Heritage is the tool to obtain something else, and mostly economic uh, benefits and development. So that's a, that's a broader problem. The UNDP was the same, actually. Um, so. It's, it's the question is to how do we disentangle what is specific about conflict and what is broader and structural about the EU uh, looking at heritage. And again, I mean, that was 10, 15, 10 years ago, so I don't know, maybe it changed, I didn't follow, but it's, it's, it, maybe that's one, one, one thing to do, also to situate the specificity of conflict um, heritage programs within the broader. عفوا سامحوني على هذه المقاطعة ولكنها ست sorry for interrupting you thank you uh, for your uh, splendid intervention I'd like to thank you for your interest you've uh, talked about uh, maintenance uh, with the support of the EU and UNDP. This, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, has uh, been linked with the municipalities. And I, as a member of the department, uh, indeed the municipality funneled the support uh, to protect Sabrata and uh, we have uh, uh, prevented any intervention in the heritage side but uh, it has been uh, funneled to maintain only the administrative kind of uh, buildings in the theater we had only cameras installed and the timber because it was dangerous uh, uh, for the visitors uh, to step on the theater without having a solid timber in place. Uh, uh, we had also put into place, uh, or indeed we have uh, uh, laid off uh, the fence that surrounded the theater. It wasn't to do with the uh, archaeological kind of site because it was just uh, a fence made of iron. We took it out. So there was kind of no genuine strategy for maintenance uh, uh, with the supervision of uh, a professional supervisor and that's why we uh, talked about uh, uh, this issue through our report uh, and we've uh, reported this to the UNESCO and the ICMOS and uh, the ICMOS and the UNESCO uh, reacted positively 
we need uh, more studies uh, to uh, uh, take the decision about the maintenance of the theater itself. But I, I belong to this uh, institution, and there were no maintenance procedures uh, in the historical uh, uh, structure itself. Thank you. Thank you. Shukran. Ismahli, so Fanastaqiya Lasila. Uh, to give Aurora the opportunity to for a rejoinder to respond and maybe to answer the first question and then we we will take another batch of questions uh, for the panel um yes thank you very much um i um So there are basically the EU um, financing was done in two parts, right? So first um, in February 2021, where the um, visitor center was um, renovated. And then the second one in 2022, um, where it says in the um, publication that um, the street lights were done and also some part of the historical renovations were done and that's what it says in the UNDP press release. And I also, I sent an email to Professor uh, Leon uh, from uh, Durham University. And she also confirmed to me that she basically saw the EU um, opening, the UNDP EU opening as a, um, uh, as a PR uh, move. And that's what you had told her, that it was basically seen as a PR move. Uh, not a real um, restoration. Yeah. Um, and I, I completely um, completely see how that's um, as problematic. And I, I definitely, it doesn't, the thing is that it's still communicated as such, as, it, as if it had been a part of the historical renovations. And it doesn't take into account the uh, report that you wrote in, um, with Professor Leon in, uh, from Durham University. So it, it's not part of a reconciliation effort, even though, th so the, the, the theater is seen as an economic opportunity and not as part of a reconciliation of the community after the conflict. So it doesn't really matter what part they renovated. I'm, I don't know um, if, if that plays a role in that sense. Okay, uh, thank you, Aurora. Uh, any a quick response to the yes, question of course. by our? Um, I think that actually has changed because um, there has <laughs> it's actually it's um, the idea of heritage has become so um, incorporated into EU finances um, when it comes to our common shared cultural heritage that has become, uh, also when you now look at finance applications, uh, it's definitely a thing. Thank you. So we will take uh, one question from this side, just for the sake of fairness, and then another one from this side. Yes, please. Oh, shall I, no, shall I ask? Yeah. Or? You, okay, you go <laughs> ahead, you go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Okay, That's fine. Uh, I have uh, thank you for the whole panel, very interesting panel. I have tons of questions. I'll ask quickly two, and you can pick up, pick, decide which one to answer, or both, <laughs> if I'm lucky. Um, my first question is about the, uh, the question of migration, because when I see the Sabrata Theater, I mean, I'm an Italian citizen, just uh, uh, a few days ago, there was a major tragedy, probably around 100 people droned uh, off the coast of Italy. They were not coming from Libya, they were coming from Turkey, but a lot of people. I mean, the question, the, the, the migration route between Libya and Italy is the most dangerous in the world. And in a way, I cannot look at that particular archaeological site without thinking of the hundred, uh, probably hundred thousand, the 500,000 people that, uh, certainly not the 500,000 people that you talks about, but they are living from a beach close to Sabrata, Zuara. 
So how do we think about heritage in those particular contexts? And this is really an open question. Can we just not, not overlook that right probably a few hundred meters, there are tons of people who are about to embark on the most dangerous trip in their life. And the other question is a bit is about whether there is an interest in Libya, or uh, uh, maybe probably that's a sensitive question, about um, uh, digging the history of the Italian concentration camps, which are quite close to Benghazi. Thank you. Yes, please, go ahead. Thank you. Um, okay, since yesterday we are talking about conflict and post-conflict reconstruction and uh, sustainable development and build built uh, back better, they come as music to my ears. Um, so I was um, wondering, when we are talking about sustainable development and reconstruction, if something as climate change has been considered or not. We know that a country like Libya is at high risk of climate change. If you, if you read reports, Libya is at risk of uh, climate-related hazards, flooding, uh, hot waves, etc., etc. We are, we, are, we are hearing here about uh, city centers like Benghazi or uh, archaeological sites like uh, Sabrata, uh, sponsored by EU. EU has been advocating climate change policies for many years for, for, for EU uh, countries. Uh, have they considered uh, climate concerns into heritage projects? Is there any discussion on how uh, a city center like Benghazi in, in reconstruction projects should be resilient uh, for, for climate-related uh, hazards? and climate change. I just wanted to know if there is that discussion um, happening or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take two other questions, one from the gentleman here, and then the other one from the other gentleman there. Uh, if you can be very brief, yeah, okay. please, just for the sake of time. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for this uh, great uh, uh, Interventions, Noor. I would like to ask you about uh, 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 focusing on the uh, old heritage and the urban uh, kind of uh, uh, streets, uh, because uh, usually people uh, think and focus uh, uh, on the heritage and they forget about the new contemporary streets. Thank you, Noor. And I am from Benghazi, and thank you for talking about uh, Benghazi. My question is as follows. Do you think that Libya is ready for a reconstruction period, especially when we see a vacuum in power and uh, division between the West and East, and so on and so forth? Uh, so the question is, is Libya ready for the reconstruction efforts? Uh, especially when we see the divisions all over the place. Who's going to supervise the reconstruction efforts in Benghazi, for example? Second, can we expect perhaps uh, uh, a military approach uh, that might propel the reconstruction efforts? Because as you know, everything is militarized uh, and uh, Khalifa Haftar uh, has always a say in this, and can we compare this to the Sisi in Egypt and uh, what the military in Egypt is doing? The co reconstruction efforts are going on in this city, but the military is uh, controlling kind of uh, these efforts. Do you think that this uh, uh, might take place? Third question, or uh, an intervention, or a comment. Uh, from my own perspective, uh, what took place in Sabrata, the EU's approach uh, and the NGO's uh, approach, uh, from my own perspective, uh, does not relate to peace building and reconciliation. However, it leans towards. Uh, uh, combating illegal migration, because uh, 
the city is not part of the conflict. It is a small part, but it is a part, a big part, uh, when it comes to the immigration. Because the internal uh, infights are internal in the city, and they do not affect the whole Libya. So the crossfire uh, affects uh, uh, Sabaratha per se, and doesn't affect the whole of Libya. We'll start with the answers, please, from my left, Noor. For the very no. interesting and some of the complex uh, questions, I will do my best to try to respond. Uh, regarding the climate change discussions, and in, in Benghazi currently there are no discussions at all. Whatever is happening is happening. Uh, like people are not aware how it's happening. Uh, what are the uh, the visions, the logics, or the, the direction of what's happening? Uh, they wake up in the morning, see demolitions happening in the in the city center. They see um, uh, con construction companies um, are like making uh, parks or gardens or roads. Yeah, these are like they are being um, there's a strong propaganda of how they are building the city and renovating city but we don't know who is designing these projects how are they designed how are these standards uh, processed how are who, who is taking the decisions who are bring who but like as a as a discussions on a vision i am not aware of any kind of vision Regarding the question of Ammar, in terms of the focus on the daily life, um, sorry, I should speak to Arabic. Um, there is a, a frustration amongst uh, the displaced persons, as you know, in the middle of the country. The middle of the country is empty, and most of the uh, families who left cannot go back to their own homes. Uh, they live in dire uh, situation, dire circumstances, and there is no solution in the horizon. There is no strategy to repatriate them or to support them financially or to compensate them for the loss of their properties. Yes, the parks are nice. Uh, the minaret is nice. The corniche is nice. However, our houses are so far from this area, so the people are disgruntled, they are frustrated because of the policy of the displaced persons. So the view of what takes place in the city is a very skeptic kind of view because people think that there is corruption and there is uh, a commercial interest uh, of what uh, is going on in our city. As for your question, uh, I'm not a politician, uh, uh, to be honest uh, with you, but uh, yes, it is difficult. Funding. Yeah, the issue of funding is difficult. Who shall pay the uh, uh, the bill? If we had uh, international organizations that uh, have uh, strategy and depend on professionals and uh, might integrate uh, uh, the professionals, the engineers, and the local community in the reconstruction efforts, then the reconstruction might be feasible. But it takes place haphazardly, kind of, and uh, uh, what takes place on the ground uh, is uh, emblematic to the fact that the issue is difficult because there is no unified uh, uh, vision, whether it is to do with the military or the uh, civil branch, because there is no uh, vision. Thank you. We'll move to Aurora. Gentlemen, uh, Mahmoud Hadi and Ahmed Masoud. But if you can be very brief, I would greatly appreciate it. Ijaz. Um, so when it comes to uh, climate change, um, that's, I think, the biggest thing uh, threatening Sabrathar, indeed. Um, and it was 
not addressed in any of the things that I um, found policy-wise. However, in EU policy more generally, climate change is always um, part of the, or at least inherited, it's always part, it was part of all the three documents uh, that I mentioned. However, it's always part of the preambulatory clauses. It does not translate yet into this, in the examples that I know, in very specific um, actions. But when it comes to climate change, I'm quite optimistic that it will. Um, and then um, I think Yara said something really important about um, the migration um, issue in Libya and um, how that is related to financing of heritage. And I think that's really important to emphasize that uh, this is a humanitarian crisis where um, the EU is then starting to finance what they consider economic opportunities that are they then not thinking through properly. So I think it's, it really um, emphasizes uh, how short-sighted some of the, those policies can be. As a matter of fact, I have uh, talked about uh, the illegal immigration in Sabratha uh, during the chaotic years. Uh, this city has been uh, kind of exploited uh, as uh, shelters for uh, the transit people or the refugees. Uh, I'm not a politician to answer this question. However, my colleague, my Libyan colleague uh, who asked this question, I would like to say that I hope that Libya uh, will be stabilized. Uh, we in the West and East uh, uh, are one department, and before I came here, I went to Benghazi and I uh, carried out uh, uh, some of uh, uh, my uh, part of mandate, and uh, my colleagues uh, move between places, and the funding and the salaries uh, come from the central government in Tripoli even if they are salaries to the militants. Uh, and uh, months ago, the military delegation came to uh, Tripoli far from Benghazi. So I, I don't say that uh, uh, we have a stability that is 100%. Uh, we still suffer from political kind of uh, uh, deadlock. But uh, on the local level, uh, I as a Libyan, I can move right, left, up and down. And I face no discrimination whatsoever and uh, uh, here I'm talking about uh, uh, my daily life. Uh, uh, there's no problem on the popular level. However, on the political level, nobody knows uh, uh, how things are uh, kind of uh, going on. And uh, uh, foreign countries are interfering in our uh, country. We don't know whether we shall reach stability or more chaos. As far as climate change is concerned, uh, we indeed monitor regularly in Sabrata and in Lubda and in other uh, archaeological sites. Uh, we monitor the climate change and we have in the, Je the Jebel area, the mountainous area, we have a project uh, on uh, uh, studying the climate changes uh, and their effect thereby on the uh, uh, archaeological sites. As far as uh, 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 the uh, Italian colonization, no, no Libyan can uh, forget uh, the concentration camps and the crimes committed uh, by the uh, Italian colonizers. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, as far as uh, my own uh, uh, vision is concerned, uh, we are in 2023 and uh, we, we hope that uh, uh, peace will prevail uh, and uh, we hope uh, that we will defend this heritage jointly because uh, in uh, uh, all the flora we say that this heritage is a human heritage. Is, uh, it is not Libyan or Syrian or Iraqi and uh, we suffer uh, from the looting waves uh, and uh, so on and so forth. We are as Arabs, 
one uh, kind of body, if one organ of uh, our body aches, then the whole body shall ache. Uh, so, and also there are some rumors and there, are s uh, there is a misinformation and disinformation that goes on a propaganda and so on and so forth. We hope that uh, uh, our rhetoric uh, will kind of reach us to more peace uh, for the benefit of uh, the whole humanity. Thank you. Thank you all. Shukran. وأنا أستأذنكم بعده على استراحة.